Well, I, I suggest we start, and then the people who don't want to come will eventually come around. So, thanks everyone for coming to uh, this Godo Meetup, generously hosted by GitHub and uh, Lee Riley uh, here at the back. A round of applause for Lee and GitHub. <clears throat> so we are pretty happy to be here. It's my first time at GDC and it's mind-blowing uh, to meet all those developers, uh, companies and game developers. It's really like, I did not expect, I knew that uh, it would be like that, but I did not expect it. Um, <clears throat> and we're really happy to be here to be able to chat a bit, have a drink, uh, show you a bit about Godot Engine. And if you missed it, uh, you have free pizza and drinks uh, provided by GitHub. And Juan is going to give a talk about uh, the state of the engine, um, what's coming up in coming in future month. Uh, so it should be, it's kind of the, the prophet of the engine. So hopefully it should be quite inspirational uh, and give you all the will to dive into the engine and to hack around with it. So I will let uh, Juan get started and the people should come over, I guess. Oh, the lights are, I, I, don't, I can't see anything. So I will imagine that you're here. <laughs> uh, well, first of everything, uh, I would like to uh, thank GitHub, not only uh, for this event, but because without GitHub, I don't think that, that would be what it is now. Uh, the way we can have like over a thousand developers working together, reporting issues and, and things go very smooth. Uh, these kind of things before GitHub existed, I think, were impossible. Just projects couldn't handle and this this amount of load. Uh, so, thanks from the bottom of our hearts to GitHub for doing what they do. It's like amazing. Uh, you allow this to happen, so it's in part your success. So, well, uh, I would like to start talking a bit about the state of Godot. Uh, I noticed that uh, tonight and all week. Uh, I got asked the same question uh, many times over and over again, uh, and which is, uh, like, what's your vision for the future of Godot? Uh, and to say truth, uh, this is a bit difficult to answer. Uh, only two years ago, I was working as a business consultant for the video, video game industry. I wasn't even actively doing any programming anymore. I was just working on Godot as a hobby. Uh, after being like, many, many years as technical director, technical consultant in many companies. So what happened with Godot was a bit unexpected uh, because it grew so much that I had to decide like dropping 20 years of, uh, of doing this for a new career, which is uh, just working on this open source engine. Actually seeing that people use it and makes them happy is what makes me uh, committed to it because I, I really see people enjoying my work. So my vision for the next years in Godot, my personal vision is just whatever you guys want it to be. Uh, whatever you want it to be, you express as a community. And uh, we take it and we try to shape it the way you like it the most. And we enjoy doing this. So there's no agenda or anything special about this. Uh, there's a whole ecosystem that is forming around Godot right now. There are many companies using it, many consulting companies around it, many consultants working with the, these companies. Uh, many companies like uh, Microsoft or Mozilla just uh, donating money so we can work on features. Uh, and more and more people get hired by either us or uh, this the sponsoring or companies. Um, it's growing very much and it's amazing to see all this taking shape. I have no idea what's going to be. I'm, I'm more interested in seeing myself what's going to be like in five years rather than trying to reach a point with a vision. Uh, it's more, much more interesting trying to follow the development of the engine rather than uh, trying to make it go. Uh, and this is pretty much also how open source works. Uh, one thing that I learned with open source is that when you work, I, I never know why it worked. Like, how can something like made by contributors have the same quality or better than something that a company makes? And the truth is that uh, we learned that. Uh, open source is just people working on whatever they want, whenever they want, but so many of them that eventually things just work. 
uh, things work out. In the end, I just buy mere uh, statistics and mere brute force. Uh, and it's like a system that out of it itself, like if there is something not working, the interest of people to do what they want, whatever they want, will be to fix this thing. So it's a very interesting uh, way. It's completely different to companies. I had companies of my own that I created on my own. I created with Ariel. Uh, and this is absolutely different to this. So basically, in the spirit of open source, I think the future is whatever the community wants it to be. Uh, so I am as excited as everyone else to see where this goes. I mean, we don't have such a long-term vision. Uh, so, well, whatever. The idea is the presentation is to tell you the state of Godot, uh, what's, what it's been like since that year. Uh, also, to discuss uh, a few of the new features we have on the roadmap, which are pretty much based on what the community has expressed uh, they needed. So. This is from last year. Uh, what is Godot? It's a fully open source game engine. It meets expat license, which means you can do pretty much whatever you want with it. The only requirement is that somewhere it can be like in the credits stream when the game ends. Just give credit to those who made it. Uh, that's pretty much the only requirement. Uh, you see that even Nintendo uses these kind of uh, things in their games, and it's fine. So there, there's like, uh, it's pretty much free. You can rename the engine to, I don't know, Doritos engine and sell it, whatever, whatever works. Uh, you have full freedom to do. It's an engine that works as if, if it was your own engine. Uh, well, as I said, we de developed this on GitHub. Uh, again, I don't think we could do this without GitHub. It's probably the most useful social network out there, if you ask me, in, the, in, in practical terms. So we have a really active developer community. You can see that it keeps growing and growing. Uh, the issues created a month and the, and the PRs created a month, a month keep growing. Uh, this, uh, this is pretty actual now. Uh, you can see that it has a very active user community. Uh, there is a, well, it's, it's growing a lot. It's bigger and bigger everywhere. We are now on Steam. Uh, we are, I, I always wanted to make a game that was released on Steam and got overwhelmingly positive. Uh, I failed, but I published many games that didn't do that well. Uh, but this one did pretty well, so I can't complain. Uh, this actually, that number is a bit old. This is from last year. Uh, I think we have uh, probably more than 600 now. Yeah, I guess people like it on Steam, which is very nice. Uh, we, see, we, we have seen a lot more commercial adoption since last year, which is pretty good. Uh, we've seen indies liking it, it's like uh, more and more used. Uh, more games are now published in Steam. Uh, many games are going to be published in console, thanks to Ariel's uh, company, Long Wolf. If you're making a game uh, and you want it working on console, you just talk to him and we can like negotiate something with him. Uh, Godot suddenly becomes super popular on Game Jam. This is new. Last year it wasn't so much like that. Like last year, remember Global Game Jam, we have like only 70 games that we got with Godot. Uh, this year we're like 200. So it seems jammers like something that is tiny and that they can download and get, get going very quickly on any computer. So I guess it's, uh, it's become a very, very nice tool just because of the nature, nature of it. Uh, as always, we are supported by donations. Uh, we work with Software Freedom Conservancy, which is a charity located in New York. Uh, donations go, every single donation goes to them and they have a mission statement that says that this donation needs to, use for, needs to be used for the benefit of the project. Uh, we do this because we want to ensure like everyone that is donating or sponsoring that this will be used uh, with the sole purpose of improving Godot. Uh, we have many companies now sponsoring and many interested in sponsoring, which is very welcome. Uh, your, your, or, or, or Marvelous community will really love you for doing this. So, well, these things you probably already know. Godot runs on the most major operating systems. Uh, or we have Linux as a first priority because thanks to Linux, Godot took off uh, very quickly because there was no offering on Linux that worked like, natively and really well without hacks or anything like that. So our first community and contributors were thanks to being on Linux. We got a lot of uh, new contributors because they wanted something working and most Linux users are programmers. So. In the end, they, they contributed a lot in the engine and started growing, even if the user base was, user base was rather small. Uh, nowadays, everything is different. Uh, most users are, are from Windows, but most contributors still use Linux, which is really nice. 
Uh, as, as always, we deploy to most platforms. Uh, we try to support this as best as possible. And well, as, as I said before, you, there's a lone wolf company from Ariel which does uh, provides the third party uh, console support. Uh, our priority is to make the code base as tidy as possible because otherwise we wouldn't be able to get as many contributors as we do. Uh, we have a very, very high quality bar for any contribution. Uh, they may be going around for a while until they get merged, especially when it's a new feature. Uh, it usually gets discussed by a lot of members of the community. We go around, some may take a year until it's ready to be merged because we are very like uh, obsessive with having really clean code so others can understand it. So this is probably what many were waiting for, like what are the plans for the future? Uh, these plans for the future are mainly things uh, we core contributors. Uh, many of this was decided in Brussels. We have the, um, the Godot Sprint now, which is a new event where only the Godot contributors meet. Uh, since most of them are from Europe, uh, we meet in Brussels, which is very central to Europe. Uh, and we decide a lot of implementation and the future of the engine and what are going to be the next steps uh, for, for the engine. Uh, once we discuss everything, we, we, have, we have like a list of topics and we discuss every single of them uh, for two days. It's very exhausting, but what comes out of it is great because most of the guys contributing are there. Uh, we try to also uh, pay for the trip for those who aren't able to come because it's very important for us to, to get all, all our contributors together in one same place at least once a year to discuss the plans. So the main priority uh, is going to be uh, Vulkan. We used OpenGL because it was the only thing that was available at the moment, but uh, now Vulkan has become really strong. Uh, I'm also on in the Kronos Advisory uh, Committee that advises Kronos on Vulkan Matters. Uh, I meet with them every year here at GDC, and I can tell you that the whole industry is pushing very hard for Vulkan. Everyone wants Vulkan to be the de facto graphics API in this moment. Uh, all the big companies are interested in this happening. There is an amazing ecosystem work ar format around the Spear V, which is uh, the shader language. Uh, even companies like Microsoft are interested because they are supporting Spear V under their DirectX shader, shader compiler. Uh, so this is something I have never seen in my life with OpenGL. This is like 360 on, on support. You can see Google now, they announced Stadia and it's also Vulkan. So clearly Vulkan is the future, so we are going to, to do porting to it. Um, there's multi MBK that lets you use it on, on, on Apple products. Uh, so the only one remaining without Vulkan support is Sony with the PlayStation. So I hope they, uh, they take notice and finally work on something so developers can use it. I think they will concede to the pressure eventually. So. Well, basically, this uh, we want. Thanks to Vulkan, we will be able to uh, improve on a lot of limitations that OpenGL has, especially related to performance. Uh, we also met this GDC with many of the hardware vendors like Nvidia, ARM, AMD, Intel, uh, Qualcomm, PowerVR. Well, all the all the big guys. We 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 got to meet with them. Uh, they have uh, given us full support. They will help us. Uh, with their engineers to make sure what we do is as best as possible. They want to use uh, Godot as a showcase of what Vulkan can do because it will be a Vulkan-only engine that will help us with hardware, with anything we need. So we have the full industry support to make Godot succeed on Vulkan, which is very amazing. In exchange, what we will do is we will do all this port in a way where we will just do articles periodically explaining what the work is with the hopes that more people can understand Vulkan and contribute to rendering, which was which is one of the areas that we have a lot of difficulty finding contributors. So trying to document all the process very slowly with every step we do, specifying why every decision was made. Uh, this is going to, to take probably, this is going to make this port take longer, I think, because it's going to take a while to do everything this organ, in, a, in such organized manner. But I hope it's going to pay off in the long term so we can get more rendering contributors, which is our, weakest area for contributors, even if we have a lot of them. So one thing community re requests right now is that they adding like uh, models for Android, like SDKs they want to add is very difficult right now. You have to recompile the whole engine if you want to add like add more. And for most users, this is like unacceptable and it's, I understand this. 
So uh, this is a 3.2 uh, goal, so it's going to be in a few months. No, no, no need to wait until the end of the year. Uh, the idea is that you will be able to just have a template and project. You will be able to modify it as much as you want. You can add, uh, change the manifest, do anything you want. And Godot will automatically create the APK, which is the export template for it, and use it to export. So this will allow us to keep us using the current way of exporting to Android, which is very uh, optimal if you have ever used it. You just press play and it's running on your cell phone. Uh, you can even submit like a small uh, binary and read all the files from the USB cable. So this makes it creating your mobile very efficient. Like no other engines has anything like this. So the idea is to keep the current workflow, but allow the developer to have more control on what the uh, compilation of the Android. So we can open it in Android Studio, or we don't code, whatever, and Godot will still use it as a template. Uh, this will also make it much easier to distribute anything like AdMob if you want to use AdMob for Godot. All you will have to do is just download the, the, the SDK for, for AdMob, and Godot will automatically add it to the Gradle uh, build process when it builds the template. It should be automatic. Uh, so this should hopefully remove the pain points uh, in exporting with SDKs to Android. This is probably the second most requested feature after uh, FBX, which is the next one. Uh, the idea is to add FBX support. Uh, the problem we always have with FBX is that it's totally closed. Autodesk uh, is a very like commercial-oriented company. They don't really care about bringing any good to humanity. They only want to make money. You know, there are companies that actually sacrifice uh, a bit of revenue just to be, like, contributing to humanity. Uh, Autodesk is no such company. So they will sell you, if you want to use the FBX in your project without having to show, like, a huge EULA every time you open Godot, uh, which is, of course, totally unacceptable for us. Uh, the only way is to pay them money uh, for this, and I don't think that would even work for an open source project. So uh, they could have implemented GLTF2, which is a fantastic uh, uh, specification for exporting data to game engines. Uh, everyone is using now F GLTF2, even Facebook, you can upload the model of GL GLTF2, Substance Painter, everything but Autodesk supports uh, GLTF2. So we, you can also do that. So Thankfully, the guys from Asimp, which is this library that loads and saves many formats, they finally cracked FBX, and they have it working very, very well. So what we're going to do is use Asimp to implement uh, FBX importer. Right now, Ernest Lee is working on this. I'm not sure if Ernest is here. He was here just a minute ago. Are you here, Ernest? He's not here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Nice. Thank you, Ernest. He's, he's adding the FPX support. I will give him a hand to complete it like probably next next month. Uh, so the idea is to have a shorter release of Godot 3.2 with the feature we cannot know without breaking any compatibility. Uh, Ernest's work is uh, uh, is uh, sponsored by MVU, uh, which which is uh, one of the big companies using Godot, and they trusted the engine. Uh, well. Uh, some work will be done in navigation. Right now, the navigation support is a bit basic. Uh, probably not much we will be improved, but it will be mostly reorganized so it can be improved. Uh, the idea is to move navigation to a server, no longer to a node. Uh, so we can do, like for example, multiple queries on different threads, which is now possible. Not possible now because nodes don't run on multiple threads. Uh, we can integrate recast better, so you can recalculate the navigation polygon like every a few seconds. Uh, we can support a, an agent node, which is currently not possible because of the way navigation works. Like just, you put your agent and you let it go there and it will move along. Right now you have to do all your path following yourself, which is kind of a hassle. Uh, we can add uh, like local obstacle, local obstacle avoidance. We can support off, off mesh links and make it a bit more modern. And also allow contributors to contribute like more code for this, which is a bit one of the weakest points uh, in the engine. Uh, this also is very requested. Uh, the idea is to add multiple window support, uh, so you can use both games and the and the editor. This is a very requested feature, especially by companies that do like on-site installations uh, or, or custom machines or anything like that. We have many of them requesting this, so this is going to be done like. For the next Godot version, uh, the one working on it will be uh, HP, Him Peter. He's like around there. 
uh, thank you, him, Peter. He's he's our like uh, guru of operating systems. Like this guy is a genius. Thank you for all your work. So um, we will do a split of the OS and display classes. So we can, for example, you can run on Linux, and we can use like X11. You can use Wayland, or you can use just a dummy render or display. So it just can use it as a server. Uh, there will be. I will speak more about this in. I think it's the next slide. Uh, we got together with the guys from the the, the company that works in Haxi, and they expressed very much interest to support it in Godot. Uh, Haxi has a very uh, strong community of indies that develop uh, very known games. Uh, there are many things about interesting about supporting Haxi. The first one is that. Uh, you don't really need to implement it in the core engine. You can just use Gini native. Uh, so this is going to be probably, we are trying to see who's going to do it, but the idea is that they express interest in, in providing a hacks implementation for Godot. So it will be just use something you download from the asset store. And if this works properly, it will be a very nice alternative for those who don't want to use C Sharp uh, because it's a strongly typed language that you can like optimize. It will be another alternative of the many we have, but this one probably is going to be pretty uh, interesting to many because of how much support it has. I don't know when it's going to be done. This is just a very early announcement. Uh, but yeah, it, I think it's a, it's a pretty nice language with a lot of support and a lot of fans. Uh, they will be happy to be able to use Godot with the language they, they love. Uh, this is another big on the, rent, on the list, uh, which is moving to C++11. We are currently using C++03 because Godot is much younger, much older than C++11. Uh, the problem with C++11 is that it's very easy to make unreadable code, thanks to many of the things like autos and lambdas and ma many things they have that if you don't know what you're doing, you can make completely unre unreadable code. So we will make a document stating what you, will be accepted and will be not accepted to the code base, like auto keyword is banned. You will not be able to use it in Godot because it makes code unreadable. And these kind of things we, we will uh, we, we will submit to as, as guidelines to contribute. The thing is that C++11 has many things that are really good for us. Uh, all the atomics and street support is really good and it's much faster than having to go through the threads and everything like that. Uh, it has many improvements to how we handle templates, which is kind of hacked because of how C plus plus L3 works. Uh, you have inline in initializers, which makes the code much cleaner and it's much difficult to, to forget to initialize a variable because you will see the variables and their initialization. It will be very difficult to, to fuck up on that, thanks to the many features. So yes, as we said, we're going to work on this very quickly. Uh, the idea is that the next Godot version will support C++ uh, 11. We won't just move all the code base to it. We will just do work like, for example, improving our template support. We will support, uh, we will change our, all, all of our initializers to inline, so it's like less risky to forget about something. Uh, so yes, that's basically uh, what we'll do. But uh, again, there will be a, a, a guideline of things you will, won't be able to do in hopes of, like, for example, all our iterators will remain like now, which is very low level and hardcore. Uh, don't want to use like for each things or anything like that. It will still be very low level as if you were almost writing C code, which makes it more readable for contributors so far. So uh, this is another goal we have, which is to optimize GScript a bit more. Uh, we added, uh, Specialist, uh, specialized typing in, in Godot 3.1. Now you can put types on things. Uh, for Godot 3.2, what we want to do is uh, extend it a bit. Like for example, for dictionaries and arrays, you will be able to put a type, which is not possible now. Uh, and doing this will allow, will allow us to do something called like, typed instructions, because right now the VM is totally dynamic. Even if you have types, it's just compiled to dynamic. It doesn't do any performance increase. So having type instructions will increase performance a lot because a lot of time is uh, is lost in like addressing modes, hash tables that will be completely gone if we make uh, type instructions. So the idea is that you can still use GCP as now, use it dynamic and everything. And if you really want to improve the performance of a, of a section of your game, then you go typed in that section. Uh, the Godot editor like shows you which line is typed which will allow you to optimize very easily. Like just make sure your function is all typed and then this function is going to run much faster. Uh, so you can optimize in a rather easy way but without having to rely on things like cheating, dynamically typed languages. We can be like, you don't know, really know what it's doing and when it's optimizing and when it's not. I think it's much better that you just type whatever you want fast uh, and that would be much uh, better. 
uh, it's a lot less effort in the end and you have control of what is passed and what is not. Uh, one thing that was requested, right now you have the pull vectors, but accessing them via GDScript is kind of painful, so one of the things we will do is they will be more accessible, they will not be like copy and write, you will be able to just keep a copy and keep editing it, which is not possible now. And it is to do improve improvements to the syntax also. We want first class functions. This was uh, requested by a lot of people. Just use a function as a variable. It's not possible now. The idea is to make it possible. Uh, many people requested lambdas because if you are using signals, you may want to use a lambda instead of having to create a function. It's, it's nice syntax sugar. The idea is to add this. Oh, this is a nice one. The idea is to be able to run Godot on the web. Uh, we talked to many uh, education institutions uh, and they told us that they would really like to have this because uh, they installing everything on their, on their networks. networks is not always easy, that many times students bring their own devices. So having a lot installed everywhere, maybe the devices may be like Android or anything, or maybe a tablet with a keyboard. So the idea is that if we have Godot running on the web, they will be able to, to just like, open a new URL and make their game. Uh, this work is financed by uh, the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, they gave us a grant for this, so uh, we will have a developer, which is Leon Krause, who's going to start next month working on this. And the idea is that for Godot 4, we will let you like host your own server for running Godot. Uh, you will be able to choose which kind of files you want to use, if you want to save to like Drive or Dropbox or whatever, or maybe an internal server uh, of, of your institution. So this is, this is something that will be really cool because currently there is nothing uh, of this level of complexity like Godot that can run on the web. Yeah, that will be pretty cool. Uh, this one has also, also been very requested, that is to integrate web, web RGC. So like web games can use, uh, you can run multiplayer on web games, which is something that was very requested. Uh, we will have better web software support, DTLS over UDP, which was requested also. Uh, this work is also financed by the Mozilla Foundation and it's going to be done by Fabio Alessandrelli. Um, and well, that's so far. Uh, if you have any questions, anything you would like to know, uh, and I have the ability to answer, uh, it's very welcome. So well, if there is any questions, go ahead. Otherwise, thanks for coming. Uh, we have microphones here. Oh. It works. Uh, so you talked about uh, some improvements to GD script, like uh, I can't hear you. Can sorry, you? sorry. Uh, you talked about a bunch of improvements to GD script, like first class functions, which I'm very excited about. But I would like to to ask if there's any more like Python sort of uh, uh, functionalities that you are looking into adding to GD script, like. Uh, list and dictionary comprehensions are usually very useful in Python, and maybe like custom exceptions and exception handling. These are like fun uh, functionalities I'm used to work with in Python, and I miss from GDScripts. Are there any plans to include those? Uh, actually, this was discussed a lot with the contributors. This was a very big topic of this discussion because we actually had contributors that contributed to this functionality, and there was a lot of discussion whether it should be merged or not. Uh, and the reality, uh, kind of the philosophy behind Godot is to make uh, GDScript as readable as possible so people can share it and it's easy to understand. Uh, a lot of the more advanced Python functions make code completely unreadable. Uh, you understand it when you code and you are more efficient typing and everything, but it, the code becomes unreadable. So we decided to just not do this. And this also keeps the complexity of GDScript lower, so it doesn't need that many maintainers. Uh, so far, the community is kind of happy with this. Uh, so we will add what, what people really, really, really want in the sense that uh, it will make their life easier. Like right now, uh, not having a uh, first class function is a pain for a lot of people. So we're definitely going to add this. Uh, we're probably going to add annotations. Uh, all all these awesome. uh, custom, custom types were added. 
but generally any Python feature that contributes to code being unreadable, uh, we prefer not to do it because there's a lot of people sharing code. What, there's a lot of community that shares the code they write to the others. And honestly, you maybe save like 10 seconds of typing, but most of the time when you're programming, you're thinking, not typing. So to us, it's not sure. that important to have those features. And it's better that the GDScript code, since it's meant to be something that people can catch and learn easily, remains always very easy to read. That said, uh, there is now uh, Python support. I think you can use it via GD Native. Uh, not sure why the state is, but I think there are many users using it right now. Uh, so if you want the, the full Python library and everything, you, you can use it. Of course, the limitation that this only works on PC because on Android you just can't get all the Android stuff and all the, all the Python stuff in it, all the libraries and all the models and everything. So I think the best of all words is just keep GDScript as something that is easy to learn, easy to use, not too complicated to read, uh, which allows community to show. Imagine that if GDScript has, has been something like Perl, uh, people will look at examples of it and they will, what, the, what is this? I don't understand. So we try to make it easy so people can share it and understanding. And if you really want something more complex, maybe go into something like Haxe or C Sharp or Python, Real Python. Uh, maybe better if you really like to do this. I mean, I, I'm not someone who thinks that everyone should use GDScript. Uh, I think for most cases and for most people, it's probably null. But if you can't use it, I wouldn't try to make GDScript please everyone because it would be really, really impossible. So I hope that answers. Yeah, yeah. If I can ask like a, a follow up, uh, I understand like uh, that list comprehensions might be a little arcane for people unused to that. But uh, as for like error handling, um, I think that dealing with uh, exception and typed exceptions instead of like returning an error code or, or checking for no in a return value is actually more readable. So could you share a bit of the reasoning to yeah, not include exceptions those? Exceptions don't exist in Godot for a very by design. Uh, at the beginning, we were discussing doing this, but the reason the exceptions don't really exist in Godot or, or in GDScript is because when you are, we, we've worked a lot with Ariel uh, um, in, in games that like that ship and have to be maintained and people will try them. And we think it's better that if something fails, it keeps working, it doesn't fail. I mean, if there is a problem, it should throw an error so you can know what it is, it will log the error, uh, but it won't crash. It will try to make it best intention and to continue working, you know? Uh, because games are something that it, once you ship, if they crash, uh, you, something bad can happen. You know, you lose your progress. Uh, it's not always easy to patch it. You may have to wait to patch it. So the Godot is designed to be like very, very, very error tolerant. Pretty much everywhere there can be an error, we try to handle it without crashing. Uh, so something is printed to the console and it continues going. So exception handling is not done on purpose for this sole reason. I mean, just go and look at the error log and check what failed and fix it instead of, if we put exceptions like everywhere, then the problem is that if you have to catch the exceptions, I mean, if you throw an, an exception, you have to catch the exception. And programmers won't take the work of catching anything. If you're working on, I like, don't know, server code or anything and you, you're fine with things like crashing and not working anymore, well, you can fix it and you can iterate it, but with games, that is something that goes away from you and you don't touch when it's out. Uh, you don't have like direct access to it as if it was your own server. Uh, and it, you, you really have an iteration time until you can update what is running. Uh, it's much better to not use something like exceptions, but instead try to be as most as ter error tolerant as possible. Just throw an error and continue going. That, that's why exceptions are not handled by design. I see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Awesome. Um, so it's good to hear the, the uh, Mozilla's, uh, Mozilla has given you a grant for the web. Uh, do you already have contributors who are going to be working on the web build of the Godot? And what renderer is are you intending for the uh, web version of Godot? Uh, the idea for web, uh, the one going to be working on this is Leon Krause, SK on IRC. Uh, if you're interested in testing this, he will be very happy. Uh, so just uh, let me know, drop me an email, or just come to IRC and talk to him. He will start working next month. Uh, probably don't annoy him too much until he has something working because 
he will feel a lot of pressure. Uh, but I think in like one month later, he will have something working. Uh, one of the nice things is that finally WebAssembly has threading support. Uh, this allows us to make the full editor work without changes almost on the web. Uh, before, it did a lot of hacks because only one thread was available. So uh, just talk to him, tell him that you would love to test what he does, that you have your students would love to test what you're doing. Uh, I think he will be very excited to know that somebody will be testing his work early on. So just let me know, and that that will be. It. Okay, thank you. Just to answer on the web web API, I think we will go for WebGL one. Oh yes, sorry. Because we were at the Kronos Dev Days, and everyone was super ecstatic with about WebGL two, but there are still only ecstatic about it, but the support is still crap. So we are probably going to go with the safe API. And eventually, we'll see if WebGL2 is something we can work with. But Yeah, it's, it's uh, the problem with WebGL2 is the same problem with GLES3. Uh, driver support is bad. Uh, browser support is bad. Uh, it was a bad idea from our part to go with, but we didn't have a choice at the time. So. For the web, it's probably going to be uh, WebGL1, which is GLES2. You can now use the editor in GLES2, and it's perfectly usable. But the features that are not supported are just hidden, so you don't run into situations where you do something, it doesn't work. So when WebGPU comes out, maybe in a year, I hope, uh, the idea will be to mo make our bulk and render our and work on the web via WebGPU. But right now, uh, Apple, Apple is fighting with everyone about the shader language used. Uh, they are acting like little kids. So uh, when they start quarreling, uh, we'll, we'll probably have WebGPU, I think. And then we will be able to run Godot with Vulkan with all the nice features on the web. Hello. Thank you for the talk. Thank you for everything. It's really great. I'm a developer who uses Godot for a, a game. I'm very appreciative of all of the support of the community. This is really great. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my question is about, I see that you're, I'm very excited about Vulkan and 3D support. And I'm just curious about the future of also supporting 2D and completing the 2D physics and uh, physics uh, for 2D, like different hinges and joints and just yeah. that in general. Is that also a priority, or uh, or is that a, a part of the code base that is not as well uh, attended to? Uh, let me like, finish, try to put everything together. Oh, so I guess for the future, is there planned uh, more development of the 2D physics and uh, continuing of the 2D support of Godot yes, as well? Uh, uh, for the 2D part, in general, uh, this past year, uh, we did almost zero work on 3D uh, because oh, besides bug fixing, uh, we didn't edit. If you look at Godot right now, it, I don't think it has any 3D feature that is new since 3.0 because since we're planning to rewrite the renderer, I mean, any new work is kind of pointless at the moment. Uh, but for 2D, we did add up many features. We added like 2D meshes, we added, um, we have to the deformable skeletons. Uh, well, GLES2 is great for 2D because it works everywhere. Uh, we added many new things for 2D for, uh, because community, when 3.0 was mostly 3D uh, and 3.1 was mostly 2D. Regarding the physics, the thing with Godot is that the 2D physics engine is custom. Uh, the reason for this is that we try to make many things easier. Like, for example, you can use one-way platforms out of the box. Uh, there are many things like the kinematic body controller uh, that just work. It, it is like just work, just works kinematic, uh, which has improved a ton. Uh, for 3.1, you have, for example, raycast uh, to just lift your character up. You have functionality to, to properly stop and slope now. Uh, you can uh, snap to the ground if you have a if you don't want to just keep going up when you go in a ramp, now you have to stop. Those those sort of things are mostly like customized. Uh, this is not something very physics engine. Uh, for this, the physics for doing all this, the physics engine has to provide a lot of things that normally other physics engines don't support. So, 
in for the sake of use, for the sake of usability, Godot has a custom, very custom to the physics engine. The problem with it is that it's still very old. It never got too many improvements. So in so many situations, it may go slow. It doesn't support multiple threads. Uh, the collision code could be really improved. So the thing is, right now it works mostly. It needs maybe more optimization and more fixes. Uh, my personal plan, at least, uh, is for Godot 4. I will not really do any improvement on anything. It will be just rewrites. Uh, we'll rewrite the render and we'll re rewrite navigation, pretty much. Uh, not much more than that. That's my personal agenda. Not We have many more contributors that may be interested in doing this, so this is my, my personal plan. Uh, after Godot 4 is out, my idea is to just uh, improve the physics as much as possible. Uh, for example, we got Bullet working for 3D. Uh, this is great, but Bullet has many problems we don't know how to solve. Like, for example, you have to use margins for the, the shapes. This is because Bullet uses an algorithm called GJKEPA, which lets you uh, have collisions with pretty much any kind of uh, convex shape, while other engines use the SAT algorithm, which only works for polyhedral and spheres derived uh, geometry, with like physex or, or anything. And this is like Godot has cylinders and Unity doesn't. That is, this is pretty much the reason because we use Bullet. The truth is that this uh, way of uh, doing things in Bullet is a bit complicated because users need to know uh, about margins and it's not very obvious. It depends a lot with the size of your scene. Uh, and if you go, uh, if your margins are wrong, then the more complex collision algorithm will kick in and this will drop your performance. I will, you have no idea why uh, many users complain about this. Uh, the other problem with margins is that it makes the borders of the objects round. Um, basically, it's like Bullet is really good for, for like movie and stuff, but for games, it's a bit imprecise. It has many things that are probably too imprecise for the game. Right now, it's working. We're not going to change it, but after Godot 4 is released, uh, I plan to personally uh, investigate a bit more. Uh, I don't know what will happen. Physics is now open source. So I will give a check to physics and see if it can be adapted to the way Godot works. Uh, maybe in the end, what I will end up doing is just uh, take the, the old Godot 3D physics engine, which has many limitations. Uh, maybe take physics code that I find useful and create kind of a chimera. Uh, but the good thing about this is that uh, Godot physics engine needs to be designed to be easy to use. Like all these kinematic things that we use, or maybe we can do the one boy platforms like for 3D, which many people requested. Uh, having a very custom physics engine, I mean, we will never probably achieve the performance of the more high end uh, engines, but at least the usability will be much better. Like, you will be able to make things that just work. So, this will be like a big investigation that will need to be done after Godot 4 is out. And um, my idea is that maybe for Godot 4.1. Uh, try to uh, have all fixed both uh, have both physics engines fixed and modernized and got to run like as best as possible because both are like 10 years old now and didn't get uh, much of upgrades and eventually we'll see if we can still support bullet because maybe for many cases it's, it's useful right now you can choose the physics engine so maybe we will just continue letting you choose the physics engine and make a default one that may not be the fastest but the most accurate uh, other things for example when you Students and many people using Godot uh, complain that if you scale a physics shape in like non-uniform ways, so it just breaks, mm -hmm. which is normal because physics engines just can't really deal that, deal with that. But we could, like, if you do it like with Book 2D, it's also going to break. But what we could do is uh, just make some hacks so it still somehow works uh, and it doesn't, doesn't break just for the sake of usability, it will make performance a bit worse, but it will make people uh, less uh, disappointed with trying something that doesn't work. So it's always a battle between performance and usability. Uh, I mean, we could make a physics engine that moves a trillion boxes, but then using it will be very difficult because it, it, everything will be designed for performance and not so that's the, the that's the at least that's the plan for the physics. But it will probably need to be next year because now most users 
don't really care that much about the state of the physics, but rendering everyone's complaining, ah, oh, you don't have occlusion cooling, so uh, <laughs> you didn't even need it on mobile, but it doesn't matter, it doesn't have occlusion cooling, so we're going to have to fix it and get it to work. Uh, and this is right now the main complaint, the, the three main complaining of the, of the community right now are rendering, 3D rendering is finally useful, so you can use it, but it sucks. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't think it sucks, I mean, but it needs many more things. So, and then FBX support is not present because now when we started, everyone used Blender because it, it was a Linux game engine pretty much. But now we have a lot of Windows users that use Maya and Max and they are like, I export to FBX and it doesn't work. And I, I could tell them like Autodesk is a horrible company, but they just want to export their files. So it's not going to help, it needs to work. So this and all the Android SDK integration are the three main pain points in the community. So this, that's the main urgency right now. Uh, so after this is solved, the idea is to fix the physics and the navigation and making like top notch. And um, by then, I think everything will be pretty much a nice base, so we can keep improving without having to do large changes, which is something where we are waiting for Godot since a long time. Uh, so I, I hope that uh, I mean probably I hope that next uh, next year, half year, Godot will be like a completely like everything will be in place. Uh, it took Blender many years to do this. Well, for now, it probably is going to be next year. It's not that long of a time. Uh, and then we will have like everything, and we can do incremental improvements on every on every feature. Thank you. Thanks for all you do. So you've seen that asking Juan a simple question about 2D physics gives you the whole roadmap for the next two years. <laughs> so I guess we'll go for our last question, and then we can go back to drinks. Hi, thanks for the talk, Juan. It was really great. Great. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, why, what stopped you from going like full C++ 14 or C++ 17, and just staying on the 11, right? Uh, the reason is that, I mean, we're not. Uh, I'm, I'm like uh, almost 40 years old now. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, not, when you're young, you just want to use the latest things and the, all the cool libraries and all the new rendering APIs. You just want to experiment with everything and you want to use everything and you're excited about everything new that comes out. And when you're like 40, you just want things to work and with the least effort possible, you know. Uh, you only care what people want uh, and, and do it. I mean, just not go and experiment things. I mean, if you're young, you just want to experiment with everything in life when you're middle age, you're like, it's okay, I know how everything works now. So let, let's do whatever it works and not go beyond that. Uh, because every new thing you try, then it's a, you learn that it's a headache for later. So, uh, I mean, I'm very much of thinking that just do what people ask for and not anything else. So there are things that we can, most of the things we can solve with C++11, uh, um, I think it's okay. Actually, we are fine with C++03, but there are many convenience things in C++11 that we can use, so it's okay. And for the newer C++, I don't know, there are many newer things that are nice, like the lambdas are better now, uh, but it's like, it's not worth it. I mean, uh, you have to understand there are many contributors that are like me, that are even over 40s contributing to Godot, and they just don't give a damn about the new C++ versions. They just like what they know and they just want to contribute and they want to spend time learning new things. Like, So we only move to a newer version if it really makes sense. I mean, we are fine as we are now. We could continue. I mean, if you look at C Python, it uses C++ C89, I mean, and they are fine with C89 and Python is C89, it's fine. No one cares. Like, you have to cast everything manually, initialization sucks, but they are fine, I mean, it just works. Uh, with that, it's kind of the same, I mean, uh, 11 solves many new things, uh, it introduces a lot of uh, unreadability, so we will be very strict with that. Uh, I remember when I was trying to learn the hard pass library for, inter for internationalization and, and many things, I went to read the code and it was auto everywhere, and I couldn't understand a single line of code. Like, it's impossible. It's just, you don't know, in C, if you're using Python, you kind of guess that you can only use base types or classes. But on C++, you can be using a million things. So if you don't know the type of the object, uh, the code is pretty much unreadable. So 
uh, we go to C++11, but we will try to just keep it as C++, I don't know, uh, 98 as possible. I mean, just see with classes, as minimum as possible. Makes sense. I just hope you reconsider the 14th standard, as it's like mostly a bug fix for 11. Just yeah. Yeah, maybe like in a few years when everyone is comfortable contributing with C++11, then we can maybe use a new one. But just make people like, don't stress out contributors. Like if they have to learn like four, C++, four new C++ standards in like one month, they will be like, fuck it, I won't contribute anymore. So little by little, you know, you, we migrate to 11 when everyone is happy with 11 and everything is working and then everyone got used to it and all everything but well, then we may start discussing going to C++ 14 and then maybe after a year we could be like ah, we could use this from 17 and uh, maybe 21 because we maybe to 2025 by then I don't know uh, just make we have like a thousand contributors and many don't even like the idea of moving to higher versions because they are very comfortable with what they are so just little by little makes sense thanks yeah, I can add, add to that that the main issue is going to higher standard of C++ is that you get more features, so you get more complexity, more things available, and we have lots of contributors who learn C++ to contribute to Godot. So if we have a limited feature set, it's easier for them to actually learn what they have to use to contribute to the engine. And we also, another reason is that the higher level of C++, they are great if you have an IDE, which, like, you can use auto, that's great, because your IDE will tell you the type. Okay, auto, you can auto, 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 and your IDE tells you this is this, this is this, this is this. But when you are on GitHub, and you are reviewing a pull request, you have no IDE, you just have the raw code, you have a diff, and you need to understand what the diff does. So it has to be very explicit. It has to show directly what has changed, what is this code doing. So that's why we stayed to C++ 3, and now we're going to 11 because it has some really good features. And then we're going to evaluate 14. Like We discussed a bit about 14 uh, in Brussels, and then we were like, okay, there is one feature of 14 that we would like to use. So is it worth accepting a whole new standard just for one feature? Because then it means that the advantage of not supporting a higher standard is that if someone uses something we do not want, then we get a compilation error. So then we just don't merge it. But if we do say, okay, we just put STD, C++, 23, whatever, in the command line, then everything will compile. And then we no longer know, even I am not an expert on the standards. So I don't know if, okay, is this fine to use that or not? So it's step by step to make sure that we start with a well-defined set of features that everyone masters and that does what we want it to do. Uh, is there one last short question? Otherwise, we could wrap up. OK, then, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Juan, for the presentation and the questions. Thanks again to GitHub for the hosting, and uh, yeah, the bar is still open, there is still pizza, so have fun. <laughs>